Hello friends, Big Stupid Green here, and today we are having the first State of the Investigator video from me. Um, I've wanted to get into theory crafting, deck tech, strategy videos ever since I started making uh, Arkham Horror LCG content, and I think the problem with making a get to know your investigator uh, deck tech, theory crafting, whatever kind of video, whatever you want to try to name it, is that the player card pool is ever evolving and the challenges presented by campaigns are ever evolving. So I'm going to name my videos the state of the investigator for a specific snapshot in time. This gives me the opportunity to make update videos on the different investigators and uh, kind of check in on them and see how the new player pool helps them out. And today we're not, um, I'm not planning on doing these in a specific uh, order. I do want to get around to all of them, of course, um, but we're starting with Jim Culver, mainly because I've been obsessing over him, um, playing with my wife for The Circle Undone, as well as trying to make him work solo in Carcosa for Season 2 of the League of Extraordinary Investigators. So, Jim Culver is the musician. He has a pretty simple backstory. He picked up his daddy's trumpet, and bad stuff happened. That's pretty much it. I would give his stats a C+. Now, on the good side, he has a great health and sanity pool. Uh, most um, investigators would have a 7 and 7, and I would call that great too. But since Jim Culver is a Dunwich investigator, he gets an extra point. And in this case, it's in sanity. So where his stats drop off is his line of 4 willpower, 3 investigate, 3 fight, and 2 agility. That makes him an all-rounder, which can be okay in multiplayer, but solo, he's in trouble. The four willpower means he's not the best pure channel your willpower into spells mystic compared to Agnes or Akachi. His fight is good enough to beat rats on their own, but you're going to want help to do any other kind of fighting. And the two agility is real is a real problem in solo, and in other um, encounter decks can give you agility tests, and so it's it's a lot worse than people think. A low agility score can be. Also in solo, again, we're going to be talking about solo a lot here. If he does not put down a, a means of fighting and draws an enemy. He could be in serious trouble right off the gate. Jim Culver's Elder Sign, I give a D. It's just a generic plus one effect. You can turn it into a skull, which is mostly good when you have the trumpet out. Otherwise, it's pretty inconsequential. There are a few mystic cards that play around with the skull, but not enough. And it's obviously the Elder Sign is... The, uh, there's only going to be one of them in there, so it's not going to happen all that often. Now, his ability is very unique. He treats all of the skulls, or the modifiers on skulls, as a zero. The important thing to remember with the modifier um, text is that you're not blanking the effect of the skull, other than it's a zero. Now, this really depends on difficulties and scenarios. It is much better on higher difficulties, and generally, later on in a campaign, the skulls will get worse and worse. However, uh, the later uh, you get in campaigns, the more tokens you get, and that'll dilute the ability for the skulls to be drawn. I'm going to take a look at the first three campaigns, I'm going to have very light spoilers just looking at uh, the scenario cards and the token pools. So this is Knight of the Zealots. In standard, you have two skulls out of a pool of 16 tokens. 
or you have a 12.5% chance to draw a skull. And you will be adding an Elder Thing token to the Devourer below, so that makes it a little bit worse. Not a whole lot worse. Uh, the difference between 12.5 and 11.8 is not that big in a um, situation like Arkham Horror LCG. You're not making enough token pools to um, make that have a, um, a big impact. As we can see on the screen there, the gathering is not all that important to make the X zero. Normally, it's going to be minus one if you're fighting a ghoul enemy. Midnight Masks, again, most cultists just stick at one doom, so it's not too important. And the Devourer below, that's when it gets uh, a little bit better, where it's a minus X, the number of monster enemies in play. Now on hard, this gets a little bit better. All three scenarios, we can see that the skull makes a really big difference, changing minus twos, or worse, to zeros. And on the gathering and devour below scenarios, we have penalties if we fail. So we really want that. Um, we really find that the, um, the skull, changing the skull to a minus zero or plus zero, or whatever, is really, really important. So the Dunnish Legacy, <clears throat> we have a 13.3% chance of pulling on standard. Again, that 1 8th chance on hard and 11.8% chance on expert. And the scenarios where it really helps, at least on uh, standard difficulty, would be House Always Wins, um, Miskatonic Museum, if you have the Haunting Horror, Essex County Express, it's amazing on, because the scenario snowballs with its difficulty anyway. Uh, X is equal to the agenda, and in Essex you have five agendas, and you're always progressing from one agenda to the next. Uh, Undimensioned and Unseen, it's okay. Where Doom awaits, or actually it's not good on standard, but it's pretty good on um, on hard or expert. Uh, where Doom awaits, it's okay. Uh, it's better later in the scenario, so that's always good. The uh, clutch, um, eliminate that minus three or especially minus five. And it's pretty good at lost in time and space. Now, Path to Carcosa features the most skulls of the first three scenarios. However, on two of these scenarios, you have the dreaded reveal another token effect. This means the skull means nothing, unless you have cards on your side of the board that help it mean something. Otherwise, you have quite a few scenarios with minus X, which I think is ideal for a skull. Just blank that whole thing. And curtain call, it's especially important, as as soon as you get, I believe it's three horror, on you, the the uh, minus one changes into a minus three, and then you get into quite a lot of trouble. So, um, counting up the scenarios, Knight of the Zealot on standard, I would say one third of the, uh, one out of three, three out of three on hard expert. In Dunnage, most of the scenarios actually it helps. Path to Carcosa helps um, quite a bit of time. But drawing the skull is usually around a 10 to 13% chance. So in between one to two pools for every 10 tokens is what you're going to average. It gets better on harder difficulties most of the time. And you can increase your odds by sealing tokens using a few mystic cards, um, but that doesn't raise the chance too much. So I wouldn't count on that. Um, really changing the odds in your favor. Now where Jim Culver shines is his signature cards. First of all, let's look at the card on the right there, Final Rhapsody. It is one of the most tame uh, weaknesses in the entire player pool. You reveal five chaos tokens for each skull or tentacle token revealed. You take a damage and a horror. This usually means between one and, if you're really unlucky, 
three tokens pulled. It's really not that big of a deal. It doesn't hamper your ability to do anything, and if you have the trumpet, you're going to heal that horror pretty quickly anyway. And the trumpet is basically Jim's ability, the ability to run Jim's trumpet. Whenever a skull token is revealed during the skill test, it doesn't have to be you drawing the, uh, the uh, token, you can exhaust it to heal a horror from an investigator at your location or a connecting location. So every round or so, you're going to get that skull revealed, especially if you're taking, let's say you're in a two-player game, you might be taking between two and four tests around, um, especially if you're failing a couple of those tests. So the, uh, the probability of drawing that skull goes up dramatically in multiplayer. Jim Culver's Zero XP card pull is really good. He is a Dunwich investigator, which means he gets uh, up to five level zero cards from any other class. He has access to all mystic cards and all neutral cards as well. This helps him get options to seek out his trumpet, and he can really go in a lot of different directions with this card building, with deck building. Enemy, manage -wise, enemy management wise, he's okay. Um, Wither isn't perfect, but it's an option. Enchanted Blade is pretty good. You get to 5 fight and deal plus 1 damage 3 times with Jim. Storm of Spirits, again, it's better in multiplayer when you can deal damage to multiple enemies. Um, but it can backfire with uh, drawing a skull or other bad symbols. Shriveling, kind of the same thing. It's a bit of a bummer that drawing a skull gives him horror. Um, it's not quite as bad as Rite of Seeking. Uh, its ability to just shut down your uh, the rest of your turn. But you'll be running Shriveling most of the time, depending on the deck list. Then, of course, off class, he has quite a few options. If you're not running Taboo rules, you can just place the machete on him and be good. The automatic is okay, if a little expensive. The baseball bat, I've never been a huge fan of, because, again, you can break it really easily. Also, it takes up two hand slots, and hand slots are pretty important for Jim, who runs the trumpet. Fire axe is pretty good. Um, there's a possibility of running Jim as a dark horse deck, although, again, mystic assets are usually pretty expensive and you're going to be playing a lot of them most of the time. Or you're going to be playing Mystic Events. So getting that resource pool down to zero is quite risky, and in most cases um, not very synergistic with the rest of your deck. He has access to the Beat Cop being, um, as a uh, static buff, and being able to deal damage at the enemy at your location is nice too. The Thompson I wouldn't recommend just because it's two-handed. Um, unless you are planning on bringing up the Thompson and then using spells for all of your other needs. And even so, you need the Bandolier if you're going to want to bring a Trumpet out. And the Derringer most of the time is an inferior 45. I don't think I've seen people run Derringers in gym before, and probably for good reason. As far as the evasion side of things, he's, you're probably going to run Mists of Rely, or Riley, um, if you're worried about that. Um, Stray Cat, kind of a waste of an ally slot. Um, I mean, it's pretty good when you get to use its ability, but otherwise it's just kind of cheap and takes up, uh, doesn't give you much of a benefit, and takes up one of those precious off-class slots. Elusive, if you're not playing Taboo, is pretty awesome. If not, maybe consider Think on Your Feet. As far as clue gathering goes, I'm going to keep this list pretty short. Um, he can run all of the secret cards, all of the level 0 ones. So a lot of the clue gathering can come from that if you want to. He can run Right of Seeking or and or Sixth Sense for his clue gathering. Um, I can't speak highly enough of Sixth Sense in almost all um, non-Ursula 
um, not Ursula, sorry, non Marie Lambeau mystics. Uh, six cents can be really good, but you can also use Alyssa Graham and Seeker cards to buff his investigate skill and go that way. And he has access to all of the clue gathering tricks since he is a dunnage investigator. So that would be Drawn to the Flame, this might be the most powerful one, but you've got options like Working a Hunch, Look What I Found, and uh, Intel Report, and Scene of the Crime. Searching and drawing, uh, it's okay. Mystics have some options, but maybe not the best ones. Um, Alyssa Graham is pretty underrated. You at least have the information of what's coming up, and if it's a really bad card, or if you're on the Witching Hour phase, you can just add a Doom. Arcane Initiate, um, if you're playing a lot of spells, can be perfectly fine too. Um, scrying, again, a decent option. Um, the problem with scrying is that it takes up an arcane slot. So maybe if you're not playing on using spells, scrying could be an option. And prepared for the worst, if you're running a fighter, uh, can be pretty good. Especially if you can run machete. But uh, enchanted blade is also pretty good to find. Now seeker is where Jim gets a lot of that card search and draw. Especially Mr. Rook, but Dr. Ellie Horowitz was the first um, kind of seeker hotness for Jim. She can look for the top nine cards for a relic. Jim's trumpet is a relic, so I think that's pretty self explanatory. But Mr. Rook, which is, um, he's quickly becoming one of my favorite allies. Um, he can look three times, he can look through the top nine cards of your deck and draw anything you want. You're going to draw a weakness, but rem as we remember, uh, Final Rhapsody, Jim's personal weakness, is really, really tame. No, no Stone Unturned is a decent option too, especially if you want card search, but you want to leave those ally slots um, open for other, for other things than Horowitz or Rook. And Preposter Sketches is... Um, a decent option, but personally, I prefer No Stone Unturned. You can also dip into the Survivor and Rogue pools for a card draw, uh, namely Rabbit's Foot. Uh, scavenging is kind of card draw. It's limited to um, discard pile assets, but that can be really good with the Grotesque Statue as I believe it automatically discards itself after using all of its charges. Take Heart, of course, is all right. Drawing two cards and two resources is pretty good at the cost of a failed test. Lucky Cigarette Case uh, might have more synergy than you might think, because Jim Culver has plenty of options to boost his passive stats, and he, his skulls mean there are more opportunities to get a plus two. As far as resource generation goes, he's okay. He has one very good card out of the rogue pool, which you should probably know by now. But um, in the mystic pool, he has David Renfield, who uh, doubles as a willpower buff. Forbidden Knowledge is not my favorite card, but Jim's ability to quickly heal horror uh, makes it a little bit more viable. It's free to play, and it doesn't take up a, any slots, so at least it's got that going for it. Alchemical Transmutation might be a little bit better, um, especially if you draw a skull, although with the skull you take a damage, so fire beware, I guess. And then Uncage the Soul is uh, again, if you're running spells, it gets better. And the two willpower icons means it's almost always pretty good if you are channeling Jim's willpower in a traditional mystic sense. He also has um, access to Dr. Milan. Remember that Milan got, um, got nerfed a little bit with the taboo list. You can only gain one resource a turn from him. He's still really good though. Crack the case. Um, it's an interesting option, 
especially if you were to combo it with, say, Drawn to the Flame or other clue gathering tricks. But the real card that I would um, suggest looking for is the Lone Wolf for Jim, especially in one to two player games. Getting two resources a turn is always um, game breaking, unless you're running, say, Dark Horse. And Lone Wolf, plus a lot of assets, plus Arcane Studies, can be a pretty good combination. Now, Jim, like any Dunwich Investigator, has plenty of options as far as passive skill buffs. He can run the Rosary or St. Hubert's Key from his own class. Uh, with Seeker, you have um, Magnifying Glass and Hawkeye Folding Camera. Hawkeye Folding Camera is an excellent option for Jim since it buffs the two uh, most important stats for him. And the, with three or more evidence, it can help protect you from, say, St. Hubert's Key, or if you're taking arcane research to put mental trauma on yourself. And then he has Alyssa Graham and David Renfield for uh, investigate and willpower buffs, respectively. From Guardian, he has Beacop and Alice Luxley. From Seeker, of course, Dr. Milan. He also has access to fieldwork. Um, I'm not sure how viable fieldwork is outside of Ursula, but it's not a bad card at all. And if you really want to play, um, go a little crazy, there's Dark Horse. Which, along with the skull, is a pretty tempting idea. So as action compression, um, again, I know I sound like a broken record, but being a Dunnage investigator, he has access to plenty of action compression. He can move around the map with elusive and astral travel. He has plenty of free clue grabbing um, cards. Um, I didn't uh, list this up there, but he could conceivably run Dynamite Blast, and Shortcut is a nice free move. Now, he has plenty of Mystic Utility events, which really make him um, a powerhouse. Order Protection and Deny Existence helps nerf the encounter decks. Dark Prophecy, which is almost an auto-include, allows you to pull skulls with uh, pretty regularly. And Premonition is nice um, information to uh, whether or not you're going to pass something or not. I played around with Premonition, and generally I've um, found it pretty useful. Now, he also has some ceiling effects, such as the Chthonian Stone. There's more um, seal token cards outside of the zero XP card pool that he can certainly invest in. Hypnotic Gaze is an interesting, expensive version of Dodge. And Quantum Flux is basically a tech card for Dunwich. So, as far as Jim Culver's zero XP deck ideas, I wanted to um, show you guys my build for Jim at the moment. Now, this goes heavily into spells with double arcane research. Mr. Rook, and Jim's Trumpet. The idea is to get out the trumpet as fast as possible, and then in between every scenario, you can upgrade your spells um, ridiculously fast. I'm having a lot of fun with the deck. It also has a ton of assets in Lone Wolf, so there's often times when you find yourself with a lot of assets, a lot of resources. Uh, so if you need to reload with a new spell, or uh, just dump it into Arcane Studies, generally it's a pretty rich deck. Now this is kind of a famous popular deck from W. Barr Robinson, if I'm saying that right. It's called Jim Timeless and On Brand. This is more of the chaos manipulation um, side of Jim Culver. Um, also boosting up his stats to make him a well-rounder 
and instead of using spells, you're using his stat line. So overall, I would give his card cool a B plus. He can look for just about um, he can go in so many different directions with his uh, card pool, and the Mystic cards are decent, and they only get better when they level up. So final thoughts. In solo, he's a little bit of a challenge. He needs time to set up. Once he's set up, he's fine. Um, the all-rounder stats is actually more of a hindrance in solo because it's hard to um, pass a, a test at three skill unless you have something to pump that up. Two agility can really put you in bad spots. And later on in uh, more recent campaigns, They've kind of targeted agility more in the encounter deck. And the ability is, his ability is pretty subtle. And you might notice it doesn't make a ton of difference, depending on the luck of the draw, of course. But at least he has a great health and sanity pool. And that lets him, uh, he's much uh, less uh, fragile than, say, uh, you know, Silas Marsh or Roland or um, Safina Rousseau, uh, one of those 5 9 or 9 5 investigators. Now, in multiplayer, he is pretty awesome. You have time to get him set up, and with that flexibility in card pool, means you can kind of spec him however you want. Um, he has plenty of options for fightings, gathering, uh, fighting, gathering clues, and what I like to do is build him as a generalist. Um, I'm running him uh, that Mr. Rook build you just saw with my wife playing Joe Diamond. We both can do a little bit of everything, and I find double generalist builds, generalist builds to be better in two-player games anyway. Like a rogue, he gets much better later in the campaign. Uh, he, Mystic has some uh, access to some complete bomb cards once you start spending XP. And with Arcane Research, you can uh, have access to those cards sooner. And those five off-class slots and uh, his ally slots, those are crucial to success, and you should really... Think long and hard about which cards are the most um, important to your deck building direction. Anyway, I hope you found this video um, helpful or interesting or both. Um, I'm going to keep going with other investigators, maybe putting out one of these a week um, during the summer when I have uh, plenty of free time, but we'll see. Anyway, hope you enjoyed your time here on Big Stupid Grin, and until next time, have a good one.